Welcome back. My name is still Will. Uh, I'm going to be leading you through the first uh, school type lecture of the course. So for the next 45 minutes, we will be talking about why should you use a single dish? What are they good at? What are they not as good at? Uh, so you may, in your radio astronomy career, use a combination of single dishes and barometers, optical telescopes, etc. They're all good at different things. And we will talk about the pros and cons of single dish telescopes. So here are some single dishes for uh, our Bond representative in the room. I was going to add the 100 meter Bond telescope, but I didn't get it quick enough. So telescopes come in all uh, shapes and sizes. So you can see some of the main radio telescopes around the world here. This is the LMT in Mexico. Here's FAST in China. We have the IRAM. 30 meter. We have uh, Jodrell Bank. Over here we have Parks. This is the Udi telescope in India. You can see that that one looks very different potentially from the rest, but it is still a single dish telescope based on how it collects data. And then we have an old feed horn type telescope over here. Again, a single dish telescope, although it looks very different. And then of course, in the middle here, we have the Green Bank telescope. So we have two lectures today on fundamentals of radio telescopes in general, how you design them, et cetera, and then one about the GBT in particular. So you'll get a little bit of understanding why you might make some of these design choices over others. But these are all single dish telescopes for our purposes here. Here's a little bit of an outline for this first talk and a disclaimer that this is a school, and so you're going to see more math than you normally would in a conference talk. So for conference talks, we say don't put more than an equation or two. You're going to see more than an equation or two in many of these talks. However, all the slides are going to be posted online, and we are all here to help. Uh, please also post on Slack with any other questions. If you're not sure what a variable is, you can post on Slack, and someone can probably tell you really quickly for instance. So we're going to talk about what a single dish is. On the flip side, what, what is an interferometer? Compare the two and then talk a little bit, like I said, about why you might want to use one versus the other. So what is a single dish? Well, in my mind, when I think of a single dish, I think of a parabolic antenna, something where light comes in from a celestial source, bounces off that antenna, and goes up to some focal point up here. So that's what we have in this first drawing. So some sort of parabolic reflector, light rays coming in in a plane wave. And the reason that we use parabolas is because every light ray coming in is going to have the same path length to get up to the amplifier and the detector at this focus. So single dishes allow for free space propagation and reflection of celestial sources to bring everything together at one focal point. The voltages for single dishes are typically square law detected. So you have intensity coming in. What you read out is the square of that intensity um, as a measure of the total power coming in at that specific frequency uh, and at that specific point in the sky. But you don't need to have the full parabola to still have a single dish. So we saw that feed horn antenna on the previous slide. That is cer certainly not the bottom portion of a parabola. It is just a cutout. So you can take off part of the parabola and still have a single dish. So here I just cut off this whole right side of this parabola. And you can still see that we still have light rays coming in from this plane wave and meeting up at the same focal point up there. This is called an offset parabolic antenna. And in fact, this is what the GBT is. The GBT does not look like this, um, where it has the focus sort of centered on the dish. It's off to the side. And you'll hear a little bit later about why that is, has mostly to do with not blocking light rays as they're coming in. For both of these designs, signals from each part of the dish are added together and squared after they leave the detector. So we have half of the dish here. Well, we can cut out random portions of the dish and still have a single dish radio telescope. 
we cut out more pieces, it still is going to work the same, but you are going to lose sensitivity as you take metal away, right? As you cut out more pieces of that parabola, you will have lower collecting area and thus lower sensitivity. So this is that same picture where we cut off most of the pieces of the telescope. And I'm going to say, what if instead of reflecting all of these light rays from those pieces of metal up to a single focus, what if we just collect them right where they hit the telescope? What if we put little feed horns at each of these locations and just added them together? So we're going to take away those reflections and say, okay, light is incident at this part of the telescope. We're gonna feed it into our receiver chain. Light hits here, we're gonna do the same. It's here, it does the same. We're going to add all of those signals up. Is this still a single dish telescope? Well, it's a gray area. It's still operating the same way, um, but we've just designed a type of interferometer that works just the same way as a single dish telescope, where we're adding all of those signals together as they hit those specific portions of the dish. So here's my transition into interferometry. So there are two main types of interferometers that we can talk about. And the reason we're doing this is to show you the math, a little bit of the math of interferometry and how it overlaps with single dishes. So what we just designed was a phased array or an adding interferometer <coughs> on this page where we just add up all of the signals that are incident with those pieces of metal here. We add them all together up. Um, and so what this gives you math wise is just a single dish telescope with missing metal. So this adding interferometer. The other type of interferometer we could design is a correlation or a multiplying interferometer. So all of the interferometers that you are probably familiar with are these correlation interferometers, the VLA, um, NOEMA, ATCA, the SKA, these are all correlation interferometers. And the difference here is what is done to the signal as it comes in. For an adding interferometer, as you might expect, you add those signals together and they go through a square law detector. For a correlation or a multiplying interferometer, you have signal come in from one part of the interferometer, you have it come in from the other part, and you multiply those signals together. look at these two um, and what you get in terms of noise from each of them. So if we go back to the phased array or the adding interferometer, I want you to imagine that we have light coming in from a celestial source. These lowercase a and b are the signal voltage um, values from that celestial object. And then the capital letters here are noise from the amplifier from different parts of the antenna system. And so if we look just at this left chain, what the system is going to see is lowercase a plus capital A coming in. So you have your power from your celestial object and the power from the receiver components, all of the electronics, um, many of that, much of that can be noisy, right? And then the same thing on the right side here with B plus B. So before the detector, the signal that you would see from your whole chain, your whole IF chain plus the celestial source is A plus A plus B plus B, right? But for an adding interferometer and for single dishes like we talked about, these are square law detectors. And so after it goes through this, it just squares that intensity. So you can see for this type of interferometer and for a single dish, we have all of these cross terms that are mixing noise values with sky values. But if you observe for seconds even, the average products, the time average products, products of all these uncorrelated quantities will go to zero. So what does that mean? Well, the sky signal from over here at B should have no knowledge of what the noise is in this receiver over here. So if you time average that, that should all go to zero. Same thing with little a and capital B, those should time average to zero. The receiver should not know 
what the noise is in the other receiver either. So again, all of those cross terms are going to drop out and you will just have this at the bottom of the page as your final intensity value, your squared intensity value coming out. So you have some knowledge uh, from the output of what the receiver noise is for one of your elements, what it is for the other element, and then what the sky values are. Lowercase a and lowercase b should be correlated. Those are just seeing the sky. And so the sky intensity should be correlated for a given celestial object. So point here is that you can see all of these noise terms for phased arrays or single dishes. Yeah, so lowercase a is the signal from the sky, uppercase a that is random noise from the receiver itself, self-generated <laughs> noise typically. So I have a little bit of a question here too. I would think that higher intensity values from the sky may result in more noise fluctuations, for instance, in the receiver. But for at to zero order, they should be uncorrelated. Good question. Okay, so we're gonna bring up this equation at the bottom again. We'll see it a couple more times. But first, we will look at the same thing for a multiplication or a correlation interferometer. So we have the same setup here. We have the sky brightness, lowercase a and b, and the receiver noise, capital A and B. Coming in from the left chain, you would have A plus A, and from the right chain, B plus B. But whenever those two signals meet, they just multiply together. So you have A plus A times B plus B. And little exercise, which of these products are going to tend to zero with time? A and capital B, that'll go to zero. Anything else? Capital A small b. Yeah, capital A small b. What about lowercase a, big b? Yeah, so these three first terms are all going to drop out. So the math here is that after averaging for a correlation interferometer, um, you just get sky brightness. And so you can see here, to zeroth order, this interferometer is taking out all of these noise terms. So that's a beautiful thing about interferometry is that it tends to be more forgiving for not only interference locally, but for noise inside the electronics. Um, between one antenna and another, that noise is uncorrelated, and so it disappears. So the average output for a correlation interferometer no longer depends on those noise terms um, just on the sky brightness. Yeah. Is there, a, <clears throat> sorry, is there a lower limit in the time that you should average the signals? Uh, that's a great question. I would say on order of a couple seconds, you would be fine, but you may want to ask Steve White uh, tomorrow when he gives his front end talk, because um, he, he knows far more about the electronics there. But I think a few seconds is. So you shouldn't be able to see transient events that have uh, that happen at lower times than seconds, like milliseconds. Um, so if it's a celestial transient event, you should still be able to. Um, but if it's local interference, then then in that case, I believe that should disappear after a couple seconds. Don't quote me on that, but this is being recorded, so you can quote me all you want. Um, but check with Steve on that tomorrow. He's giving us the front end talk. Questions before we move on and compare these two? Okay, so these are those equations that you just saw. On the surface, it looks like single dishes or phased arrays tend to be much noisier, and that is true. You can pick up uh, these noise terms a lot easier with single dishes than you can with interferometers. So what implications does this have? Well, as we said, phased array, we're gonna say is just a proxy for our single dish telescope because they operate about the same here. Um, and single dishes and phased arrays are intrinsically very susceptible to changes 
or drifts in receiver gain and noise temperature. So I have done a bunch of projects with the VLA for continuum observations. I have done some with the GBT, but the GBT has receivers that do drift a little bit in gain throughout observations. And so if you care about continuum snapshots, an interferometer is the way for you to go. Right? There are other things that I'm going to sell you on single dishes. But again, drift in receiver gain over time is a drawback of a single dish telescope. There are ways that you can fight against this. And we have one receiver here that does that. It's by doing very, very quick switching. Uh, but in general, they're designed more for spectral line work and for transient events than for continuum work. So the correlation or multiplying interferometer, as we mentioned, is essentially immune to receiver gain, gain and noise changes. However, here's the drawback of main drawback of interferometers we'll discuss. Some source distributions or combinations of sources are invisible to interferometers. Um, this includes very angularly extended distributions or very smooth distributions. If you are looking at a very diffuse cloud with an interferometer that has no real knots or abrupt changes in intensity, you will not see that diffuse cloud with an interferometer. It will filter everything out. However, with a single dish telescope, it is extremely easy and straightforward to see those angularly extended distributions, very diffuse objects. So why is this? Um, anyone know why interferometers aren't good at seeing large scale emission? Because of the UV plane that they can't detect samples of those higher frequencies? Yep, so uh, Susanna is mentioning the UV plane basically has to do with the baseline size. So for interferometers, you have elements that are typically very far apart and they're not sampling shorter baselines than that. So if I'm mentioning baselines and you have no idea what I'm talking about or what Suzanne is talking about, here we are. Let's describe this a little bit. For a single dish, you have baselines, continuous baselines from zero, right? you have light coming in from a distance two elements that are zero distance apart or very close to that, up to the entire diameter of the dish. So if we, we don't normally talk about baselines for single dishes, but you can. Uh, so for a single dish, you have a continuous distribution of baselines all the way from zero up to the diameter of the dish. <coughs> for an interferometer, uh, whenever you use these elements together, you are missing all of those short baselines you're not seeing anything around zero. The smallest baseline you see is the separation distance between these minus the dish diameter. So with this interferometer, you are seeing baselines from this long out to this long, the distribution plus the dish diameter. So interferometers have longer baselines, single dishes have shorter baselines, including down to a baseline of zero. Yes. Yep. For all sky surveys, would it be better to use interferometers than for, for all sky surveys? Would it um, be better it, to use interferometers? It depends on the resolution that you want. So I have a picture of an interferometer only survey plus single dish data here in a couple of slides. You'll see. So no, it is not better just to use interferometers. But it's also not better just to use single dishes. So it depends on your science goal. Yep. I have a question about the baseline parameters. Because in theory, wouldn't it be able to go down to zero if you just use like a single dish of the interferometer? So in that case, if you have elements of your interferometer that are just used for total power, yes. OK. But the interferometer telescopes themselves tend to be a lot smaller. Mm. Um, so they're less sensitive. So you have far less sensitivity in those shorter baselines if you just use one of the VLA antennas, for instance, as your single spacing. Okay. So ideally, we would have an NGVLA with a GBT 
built there with it to get all of those baselines or ATCA, SKA, whatever your favorite interferometer is. Um, we're going to say that your favorite single dish is the GBT with Vaughn in a close second <laughs> or anyone else who has their own favorite uh, dish. So yeah, great question. So if we look at the types of baselines that are accessible to you for single dishes versus interferometers, you could put up a plot something like this, where you see single dishes go the whole way down to baselines of zero out to the diameter of the telescope. And then there's a hard cutoff there at that diameter. Whereas for interferometers, you can access much, much longer baselines, but you can't get the whole way down to zero. You can't have the telescopes overlapping, basically, for interferometers or close to touching even. So short baselines let you see much more large scale emission and much smoother distributions. And long baselines let you see more small scale emission or knotted features in maps, if maps are what you're trying to do. Uh, this equation here at the bottom is something that you have probably all seen in astronomy courses in the past. The resolution is equal to 1.22 times lambda over D. D here is just your baseline. So we talked about for single dishes, you can go down to a baseline at zero. So in essence, you have no upper limit on what your resolution is. You can see as large scale objects as you would like with a single dish, because this D can approach zero. So regardless of what your wavelength is, your resolution uh, can be sensitive to very, very large distributions. For interferometers, D tends to be larger. So usually we think of that as a good thing. And for many applications, it is a good thing to have better angular resolution. But there's a cutoff for the types of scales, the size scales that you can see with an interferometer based on this equation. So if your diameter, uh, your baseline here, the smallest baseline you have is 100 meters, based on this equation, you're not going to see anything at larger scales than that 100 meter diameter would give you. You can see smaller scales by just putting your interferometer elements further away, but you can't see the larger scale emission. Does that make sense? Any questions here? The next slide is the same, just with the recap. So to get an accurate picture of the large scale structure and total flux density in a field, which you get from single dishes, and the fine scale detail in a source, which you get from interferometers, you really need both. So if you're trying to make an all sky map, you want to use single dishes and interferometers in conjunction with each other. And for discussion on how to actually do this, Emily Moravec, uh, one of our postdocs, is giving a talk on Thursday, I believe. Yeah. I'll show some images here, but we'll do one more recap. So a single dish has its resolution set by its diameter. The bigger the single dish you get, the longer the baselines you can get within that single dish. And so the better resolution you can have, the finer resolution you have, but you can also access large scale emission. So a one meter antenna is going to have much worse resolution than a hundred meter antennas based on that baseline idea, right? hundred meters has much longer baseline within the telescope. Whereas an interferometer has its resolution set by its longest baseline. So in essence, interferometers can see smaller things. A single dish has baselines of zero to D while an interferometer has its baseline set by those minima and maxima antenna separations. And so single dishes, like we've talked about, can see bigger or more diffuse things. For cases when we do want large scale structures, we have to use a single dish in most cases, sometimes in combination with an interferometer. Here's a picture of the whole sky using four large single dish telescopes, and it contains all of the flux in the sky, including the three Kelvin cosmic microwave background. So single dishes do not filter out any emission. They get all of the flux from whichever direction they're pointing in. And so an image that can see all of the flux over the entire sky can only be made with a single dish 
telescope. Here's that image that um, I was mentioning a few minutes ago of just using the VLA versus using the VLA and Effelsberg. So the top image here has all of the flux in the sky. It is not missing a single flux. Uh, the bottom, you see much smaller scale detail. You can see the edges of H2 regions, etc. But you are not gathering all of the intensity from the entire sky just with that interferometer. You can see it's filtering out a lot of that large scale emission. So if you see really beautiful maps of the galactic plane or of the night sky, in most cases, they are going to have a combination of single dish and interferometer data inside them. So this was the glow star survey. Any questions there? Yeah, Brent. Good question online. Can we make a map of large scale structure with interferometers? You can make a map of large areas, but you are missing much of the flux from the interferometer. So you can still make, I mean, Glowstar still made this large map. And you can see basically where the H2 regions are in here. So we have an H2 region here. Uh, we have a big H2 region complex here. So you can, you can make out a lot of the details there, but you are not seeing the large scale emission. Uh, like we were talking about a little bit ago, you can take certain elements of your interferometer and use those as total power antennas. So Alma does this. They have a total power array. Right? But again, those individual elements are smaller and have much less sensitivity than using a large single dish. Does that answer? OK. So what are the practical disadvantages of single dish observing? We have beat this. Um, you are not able to resolve fine details. If you get larger and larger telescopes, you give me a thousand meter uh, single dish telescope, I'm going to be able to see very fine angular resolution, but I can't make a single dish telescope the size of the continental US, right? Whereas we can make an interferometer the size of the continental US or larger, and we have done that. Um, so interferometers just natively are better at fine angular resolution. For single dishes, we tend to try to build them very large. And so sometimes that mechanical structural complexity can replace the electronic complexity of interferometers. We're not correlating signals here in Green Bank, uh, but we have a gigantic telescope that takes a lot of maintenance on. And so it's a trade off between mechanical and electronic complexities. Uh, we also mentioned that single dishes are susceptible to instrumental drifts in noise and gain. They don't have that filtering uh, of the interferometers when it comes to those noise sources. And so interferometers tend to be better for continuum work. Interferometers also can, in principle, give high sensitivity and large collecting area. If you add enough elements to an interferometer, you can match the collecting area of a large single dish. And a final point more esoteric maybe is that interferometers or aperture synthesis telescopes can arguably obtain more information about the radiation coming into the telescope than we get with single dishes, right? They record information about phase. They have different locations where they can tell um, different sky conditions at each of the antennas, for instance. And so arguably interferometers can collect more information about the sky than single dishes. Uh, but whenever we think about that, it also means that your data sets for interferometers versus single dishes tend to be a lot different in size, right? I have VLA observations that are hundreds of gigabytes, whereas my largest GBT observation might be 10 megabytes or something like that. Pulsars tend to be a lot bigger files. But, okay, so we talked about drawbacks. You'll see that I have more advantages than disadvantages for the GBT or for single dishes in general. So again, we talked about single dishes are able to do very large scale structure. They don't miss any flux whenever you point them at an area of the sky. Uh, they also tend to be very, very sensitive. Uh, now for point sources, your sensitivity depends on the total collecting area. So 
you can have a large single dish or a lot of interferometers looking at the same point source. And if those have the same, the same collecting area, for a point source, you should have the same sensitivity, essentially, between those single dish and interferometers with the same area. However, for extended emission, your sensitivity gets much, much worse. Um, and so interferometers are hit in two ways here. So one, we talked about interferometers not being able to see that large scale emission in general, but also for extended emission, your sensitivity gets worse as baseline squared. So here, D, capital D, is the diameter of the dish. Lowercase d is your maximum baseline. And so if you have two interferometer elements that are 10 meters apart and are looking at an extended distribution versus two 10 meter antennas that are 100 meters apart, the difference in sensitivity for that extended um, emission is going to be a factor of 10 squared worse between those two distributions for the interferometer, right? So interferometers with very large baselines are much worse for seeing that extended emission, not just because they filter it out, uh, but because of this as well. For single dishes also, we are able to map very extended areas quickly. If you try to make a 10 degree by one degree map with an interferometer, it will probably take you hundreds of hours, whereas it might take 10 hours or so with a single dish, depending on your size, depending on your frequency, et cetera. So single dishes are uh, in general better for mapping large areas of the galaxy. It can be time prohibited with interferometers. Single dishes are also a little bit simpler in their operation. So you can provide a very large collecting area with manageable electronic complexity. The complexity of correlators or interferometers is huge, right? It goes as uh, basically baseline squared. And so single dishes can have that similar collecting area or larger collecting area with less electronic complexity. And it's relatively easy to do fun experiments on single dishes where you swap out receivers, you maybe make a new receiver design, maybe you make a large focal plane array, and so you add lots of beams on the telescope. You can do this relatively straightforward with a single dish where you only have to replace one receiver element. Whereas if you did this on an interferometer or the VLA, you'd have to do, to do that 27 times. Right? So we can easily implement large focal planes arrays, uh, which can increase mapping speeds even more. Um, it's also straightforward to make multi-frequency receivers that cover let's say from 700 megahertz to four gigahertz. We just did this with a project here at the, the GBT, which is patterned after a project that was done at Parks recently. Uh, it's called the ultra wideband receiver, mostly used for pulsar observations, but for spectral lines as well. And having receivers that cover different receiver ranges is pretty straightforward. And as uh, Jim mentioned, I put this in for Brett and the astrochemist in the room, the more frequencies you can see at once, the better for astrochemistry surveys. So if we can cover a large bandwidth, uh, that's really good for those types of surveys. In terms of flexibility, you can also use single dishes as a good test bed for new receiver systems. Um, a large single dish also adds significantly to VLBI arrays. If you saw the Event Horizon Telescope images, there were some very large single dishes that contributed a lot of the sensitivity to those large VLBI experiments. Um, another point on flexibility is that designing software is conceptually easier and probably simpler. Um, operating a single dish is more straightforward or going through single dish data is more straightforward than going through interferometer data. There's less, less math that is hiding the magic of single dishes than math that is hiding the magic of interferometers. Uh, we can also do commensal experiments where let's say you put in a proposal and you want to look at TMC1 for something. Uh, well, we can give that data to you and we can also split off a copy and give it to Pulsar folks to do Pulsar surveys in it or SETI folks to look for strange signals that are coming in from that. So we can split off the data and just give it to whoever if, uh, if observatory 
procedures allow. So let's talk about advantages or advantages first, and then we'll move on to some newer single dishes. We are almost at the end anyways. So here are some new-ish single dishes. You see, I still have the LMT here. Um, it's been in service since 2013, but they're still working on it, right? It's still being upgraded in many ways. So that's a large single dish in uh, Puebla, Mexico. 50 meter diameter working at high frequencies. Similar frequencies to the frequency range of Alma, for instance. Uh, we have the Sardinia radio telescope that is working at similar frequencies to the GBT, again, about 12 years old at this point, uh, but doing a lot of astrochemistry work as well. We have FAST, which has had its first light in 2016. This is similar, you might think, to Arecibo. It's built into a mountain. Uh, its design is very different, where they will pull the telescope into a parabola in different directions. So only the inner, even though it is 500 meters in diameter, only an inner portion of that telescope is actually pulled into a parabola at any given time. Uh, and that's more at lower frequencies, similar to how Arecibo was lower frequencies. We all cat prime, first light for this. I just looked online, they advertise for next year. If anyone has any updates on that, you can tell us. Uh, but first light is planned for next year for that. And Chime, I don't have a picture of that here. That was a large single dish in uh, Canada. So it's the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, originally designed, as the name says, to measure hydrogen intensity mapping. But it was found to be an FRB beast. And so it's been detecting all of these fast radio bursts um, for the past few years and is newly an interferometer uh, in, in some ways because we have an element here on site in Green Bank. Uh, there's another in another location in Canada and one under construction, I believe still in California. So those outrigging stations are going to allow them to better localize where these interferometry or where these FRB signals are coming from. So first light for Chime was back in 2017. That is the end of my story. I'm gonna leave up the practical advantages of single dish observing. Um, and say that many of the topics here that we covered are going to be covered in other talks throughout the week. This is just a large scale survey on why you might want to use a single dish and why for many applications it is your best choice or your only choice uh, versus interferometry. So with that, we have about five minutes or so for any questions. I see we already have our next two speakers. What's the name of the time stations that are here? Um, uh, we just call it Chime. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the outrigger. Just the outrigger. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yes, yeah, so there's, I don't know if there are official designations. It's probably like Chime GB or something like uh -huh. that. I'm not sure. Uh, but that one, we haven't had our first light ceremony yet, although they have mm -hmm. taken some data. The plan is to have that in the next month or two. Is it feasible to install ultra wideband receivers in interferometers? Um, if the question was, is it feasible to install ultra wide bandwidth receivers in interferometers? It can be. So the NGVLA, I believe, is planning to have 20 gigahertz of simultaneous bandwidth across much of, much of the um, frequency range. But again, you add the complexity where you have to have that receiver system accessible on all 100 elements or so or 200 elements or so so we say all the time well it's just money and engineering um, and so that that would just take a lot of money and engineering to make it happen um just the original time not even with the outriggers is that an interferometer or a single dish um i believe that operates just as a single dish um, I believe so. If anyone has a correction for me, please make it. But I think they're all just collecting total power and seeing a, a long beam on the sky. Which is, yeah. 
this, uh, the, the faster telescope is fixed to the mountain somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they have they have all of these pillars around and that has a, um, a receiving element up here that they will steer to different parts uh, over the dish. So like, let's say you're looking at a, an object over there, light would come in from here, they might put it over here, so it bounces off and hits that. But will deform the structure to pull it into a parabola. So it's, it's really cool. It's very complex uh, for the electronics and the, uh, the structures that go in place, but they're basically just deforming the dish to form a parabola pointing in the direction of the source that they're looking at. They can cover both, most of the, of the region. Um, they can see, they can't see, uh, anywhere close to their horizon, but they can see yeah. a much larger area than Arecibo could <coughs> because of the ability to steer the beam a bit more. I don't I actually don't know what the azimuth range is, but it's more than Arecibo and much less than Green Bank. Any other questions or any online? Um, so many of the telescopes have a copper frequency limit below of 120 gigahertz. How is the cosmic microwave background radiation detected? Uh, isn't its sensitivity too low off peak frequency? Um, I believe that CMB detections are mostly with uh, those other telescopes that are looking at high frequency. Um, but you can see the thermal background with, um, you can see some of the thermal background certainly with telescopes at lower uh, lower frequencies. First time that it was detected actually was with just a small horn antenna. Any of our local folks want to add anything to that? I know. Well, yeah, there's plenty of measurements still throughout the frequency spectrum. Yeah. The thermal and I don't think it was, it, that was even a horn, right? On, um, on, the, on the, Arno and the, Hensius. We're using a dish, right? And they weren't actually looking for it. They thought it was a uh, bird poop. Yeah. But that was a fish, I believe. Yeah. And it was at like 10 feet. I can't remember the frequency, but it was like. Yeah. So, so we definitely can't see the CMB at lower frequencies. Uh, a lot of the more modern experience experiments are using the higher frequency range, though. And yeah. The GRC is the main frequency for CMB. Yeah. It's a funny experiment on knowing every source of, source of noise in your observations or what eventually became the Nobel Prize for the CMB background right, or the cosmic microwave background. Right? These were folks that really knew their instruments well and were trying to trace down every source of noise. And they found this extra noise that turned out to be this signal coming from everywhere in the universe that they had no idea about. So the fact that they knew their instruments well led to their Nobel Prize. And so we we tout this as something that you get by using the instruments and understanding the instruments that you're using. You're able to flex the instrumentation a little bit more than you might otherwise be able to um, without having training at the observatory. Right? You know the frequency ranges you're looking at, you know the specs of the instruments, but you also know how you can push those uh, or trace down sources of noise and other interference. Uh, and those tend to be some of the, the most interesting things that you can look at sometimes. So that's a plug for why you should come to telescopes uh, and be trained on them. So what other questions do we have? We have, I think just, oh, we are right on time to start Larry's talk. So if there are other questions, please put them in chat um, on Slack and uh, you can talk with each other and with staff about it. So, otherwise, thank you very much.